Okay, welcome to our first online lecture session, session for the CNT 140 Structured Cabling Systems. Uh, in these classes, we will try to handle the majority of our lectures online and then handle any questions and answers uh, sessions that we may have on Tuesdays and Thursdays along with our labs. Now, uh, with that said, these chapters are going to be a touch on the dry side. I apologize for that in advance. These chapters are long. If you've read the chapters in the book already, then you understand that it's not the uh, most exciting read we have out there. Uh, for the first <clears throat> couple chapters here, as I get caught up uh, with getting these lectures online and, uh, and we, uh, we get moving forward, the uh, majority of what we're going to be talking about here will be directly out of the book, but as we progress through, I'll do a little bit more summarization and we'll work from there. Now, uh, which takes us to now our, um, our first class, or our first chapter, which is the Designing Land Wiring Systems. Now, for some of you, this chapter is, is going to be more of like a refresher with possibly some new vocabulary thrown in here and there. Uh, this chapter itself is going to cover uh, the goals of the structured cabling uh, basic terminology, uh, the horizontal backbone and structures. Uh, a structured design, a design example um, would be like mixing data and telephone, uh, the events in the land wiring technology. So basically what, what we're talking about here, basically our land wiring is, is how we cable our networks and how we connect our computers, our printers, routers, switches, and the other devices. Uh, it is the physical backbone of our networks. It is the medium over which all computer communications uh, function. Now, it is a digital world and essentially all of that world is connected with structured land wiring. And data is obviously digital uh, in nature, but most people don't know that our voice conversations are often digitized at or near the source and both uh, broadcast and cable television are, are rapidly moving to an all digital format as well. In some cases in our local area we already have hit that. Now even though wireless commun even wireless communications for example from cellular telephones to satellite links are digital and over the years the land wiring has developed into a highly sophisticated science with a tremendous impact on the performance, reliability, and maintainability of your network. Now while a land comp comprises uh, many components, the underlying wiring system is the foundation upon which all else rests. Now without the proper physical connections of copper wire, fiber optic strands, connectors, punch down blocks, jumper cables, patch panels, and so on, the network will not operate reliably. Now it is quite important that you uh, properly plan, specify, and implement a LAN uh, cabling system that will provide your organization with the reliable level of service that they require. The use of the appropriate component parts and good workmanship in your wiring system will ensure that it can meet the performance standards that are expected, expected for the type of land that you're installing. Now, in addition, you should always plan for as much future growth as feasible within, obviously, the financial restraints of your companies or in your organization. It is, uh, it's now time for us to talk about the evolutionary and revolutionary advances that land wiring systems uh, have gone through and the land wiring systems are in a constant state of change and as, um, as are all computer systems. Now as with computer technology, some of the changes in land wiring technology are evolutionary and some are revolutionary. So for example, ex uh, accepted land wiring techniques, uh, components and practices uh, tend to evolve as the manufacturers, installers, and the users refine the existing wiring technology. Now, the introduction of uh, tighter cable link performance standards and the trend towards uh, toward guarantees the uh, guarantees of component performance are perfect examples of evolutionary change. Likewise, the introduction of a new cable type, the outlets and the patch panel designs, are also evolutionary. An evolutionary new product does not represent a major technology shift. The refined product uh, merely has an enhanced level of performance or is more convenient to use. On the other hand, 
some changes are revolutionary. A revolutionary change is one that breaks with the past. In technology, this implies a product or a method that is no longer compatible with past items, but offers greatly increased capability. For example, an increase in land speed is revolutionary. For the most part, the technology required to increase from 10 meg to 100 meg or gig or even today a 10 gig system is a clear break from the previous practice and is highly desirable but no longer compatible with the past. Revolutionary changes tend to be abrupt. Now the main focus of land wiring system design uh, effort must be to keep with evolutionary changes in the wiring technology that will then enhance the value of your system while attempting to plan for the next revolutionary jump in land technology. Now when land wiring over twisted pair wire first began, little was known about the importance of the wire performance. The initial interest in twisted pair or ethernet was to be able to avoid bulky coax cabling systems and use one's existing telephone wiring for the installation of the network, therefore saving the enormous cost of installing new cabling. However, we soon found out that the typical specifications that were fine for telephone use were rather marginal for land frequencies. Now, that needed uh, much higher twisted twists per foot uh, as well as much uh, better impedance and crosstalk control. <clears throat> now, to make matters worse, the deregulation of the telephone industry at that time was uh, meant that cost-conscious installers sometimes used an even cheaper grade of telephone cable that had two twists per foot or even less, making it totally inadequate for land data use. Now, to use twisted pair with confidence, the land manager and the land installer, they needed to be certain that a land cable would perform adequately. Performance specifications involved uh, evolved that uh, categorized uh, cable performance by, in, uh, by intended use. Now, an early attempt to indicate uh, expected performance by setting up cable manufacturing quality levels eventually led to a well-researched and detailed set of industry standard performance specifications in five categories. Now, the land user uh, now <clears throat> could know with certainty that a Category 3 cable would operate well on lands up to 16 megahertz uh, for enhanced bandwidth, and that a Category 5e cable would perform to 1,000 meg per second or a gig. Now, many connector and wire specifications have evolved in this way, along with standardized uh, workmanship practices, to provide a platform of internationally recognized standards that virtually guarantee a properly performing land wiring system. Now, this process is not difficult to understand, but the land manager, installer, and technician must have a thorough understanding of the standards, the procedures, and the specifications needed for a specific, uh, for a specific uh, network cabling plan. And the plan will have to comply with land operating standards. Now, the, the careful planning of standards uh, compliant cabling is called structured cabling. Now this chapter will give you an overview of the philosophies in designing, planning, and estimating a land wiring system. The items in these sections are, should be ready knowledge before you uh, delve into the rest of the book. Now a central theme of the book is, is that any wiring design should be standard installation, should be a standard installation that supports a, at least a minimum performance criteria. Now it's simple to install and, and to maintain and provide adequate future ex expandability and growth. Goals of a structured design, which is maintaining the proper standards of your cable installation, is the key to getting the most from your land cabling system and the internationally recognized standards that exist to ensure that the combination of wiring connectors, hubs, and network adapters will all perform properly in a completed network. The newly revised wiring standards make special note of specific cable installation guidelines and workmanship practices that have been found necessary for the more demanding modern networks at speeds of 100 meg per second and beyond. Now, land wiring standards cover everything from electrical performance to safety issues. Should you 
dream up an exotic wiring system that meets your creative needs? Uh, should you try to use some existing older data or telephone wiring and add whatever else you need to make the system work? Should you pick and choose from various manufacturers catalogs? How do you sort out all these options? One way to proceed is to choose a very structured land wiring installation that uses these standards to your advantage. In such installation, you will wire your cables in a manner that will support the widest variety of, of current and future applications. This means that you must use the proper cable, install it properly, maintain lengths within the maximum uh, prescribed uh, distances, use only connectors and jacks that meet the category of uh, operation that you need, and use proper installation techniques. In addition, you will want to thoroughly test and document your cable system for the appropriate level of performance. Now, of course, any future changes and additions to your standard cable system must also be done the same way. So, designing a standard compliant conventional installation will have distinct advantages. For example, your properly installed cable will never contribute to a connectivity failure. You can be assured that any problem will be found in the network hardware or software that utilizes your cabling system, not in the cable itself. Now that is true assuming that uh, no inadvertent change has occurred in a cable. Now, naturally, it is always possible that someone could damage a cable while doing unrelated work on electrical, plumbing, heating, heating and ventilating, and uh, air conditioning system, or even a telephone problem. Now, remember also that uh, user cables, the ones that go from the workstation to the wall jack, are considered part of the cabling system, and their failure can indeed disable a network connection. <clears throat> Your standard installation will also ensure that any trained cable installer will be able to easily expand, troubleshoot, or repair your cabling system. If you test your cable when it is installed, you will be able to retest any cable drop and compare the results to the original cable certification done at installation. You will also know that your cable system meets electrical and fire protection standards required by local and national authorities. The standards you need to reference are described throughout the book, and they're listed in the appendix. And the appendix also has or also contains sources for copies of the uh, pertinent standards. Installability. Your land wiring system should be easy to install and maintain. A variety of wire types, connector types, termination devices, and patching devices exist to support uh, exist to support uh, network wiring. The best choices are those that support your application, present and future, and are easy to properly install using a minimum of special equipment. However, you must make many additional choices concerning, concerning the particular wiring components that are to be used. For example, what types of jacks are the easiest and most reliable to use? Should you use a punch down termination and cross connect wiring in the wiring closet or should you terminate cables directly onto a patch panel? Where should the telecommunication rooms be located? How should the individual cables be run to avoid electrical interference? And there are other performance decreasing factors that need to come into play. What color should the cable and connector uh, plates be? Now some guidance to these choices um, is provided by recognized installation standards, but many are a matter of personal preference. For example, some jacks use wire termination methods that uh, require special tools while others do not. The experience level of those who will install and maintain the cabling systems is also going to be a factor. Some items are more easily installed and use such things as uh, color code marking to simplify the process. Outlet plates are available that have 
modular construction. It allows you to mix connections for data, phone, and even your cable TV. Installability will also have an effect on system cost. Now, whether you're doing the wiring yourself or using a contractor, factors such as time to install and reliability will be important. The easier the wire components are to install, the lower uh, will be your cost of installation and a contractor will charge less because the installation will take less time. Doing the work yourself will cost less as well. Now, installability, however, uh, does not mean uh, the taking of shortcuts. Your goal is to achieve a very installable cabling system that is easy to maintain and meets all appropriate standards and performance criteria for your present and foreseeable future needs. The sections on wiring, wiring devices in part two of this book will show you a variety of wire termination devices such as the jacks and the patches and we'll compare the different installation techniques that installability, uh, the reusability. Uh, everybody involved with computers and networking knows by now that technology moves very quickly. Changes are constantly made to upgrade performance and throughout and throughput. As we all know, nothing uh, stays the same but change itself. You cannot always afford to install the true leading edge technology, but you should at least design your cabling network to allow for a future upgrade without replacing the cable. To do this means that you must design a cabling system that totally meets your current needs. And if the current need is 100 base T, then the cable system should be specified so that it meets the requirement as a minimum. If, if possible, it may be convenient to design your system so that it could support multiple applications such as data and voice or uh, data and video conferencing. Then you should address what future standards uh, for which you might uh, reasonably be expected to use the cabling system with. You should also take into account the useful life of your facility which might be 5 years or even 20 years. Are your offices in leased space? You might expect to move in less time than if you own the space. It might be best to overwire by putting in more cables or cable pairs than you currently need. You may wish to use a modular outlet jack that allows the connector to be changed without, the re without re-terminating the wires. It may be virtually impossible to make uh, any accurate te technological prediction more than 5 or 10 years out. Consider for a moment what technology changes have taken place over the last 10 years. Undoubtedly, someone somewhere made an, an accurate prediction. However, there were also several predicted technolo technology directions that simply didn't pan out. Of the predictions for the next decade, which should you choose? The only practical approach, approach to cabling futures is to determine a, determine a cabling method that meets at least the current widely deployed technology requirements. You then should consider installing to meet cabling standards that are at least one level beyond those current requirements. If this is not cost prohibitive, your cable system will be able to go, go through at least one generational upgrade without replacement. For example, if you currently need a 100 base T or a 100 megabit uh, uh, token ring network cabling system, you should consider installing a cabling system that will support 1,000 meg or gigabit technology. Now, because much of the current uh, com componentry is being manufactured so as to exceed that data rate, your system will probably support a second upgrade to uh, 1,000 meg or gig. Now, uh, changes in cabling technology are a challenge for anyone. Now let's talk about reliability and maintainability. Does anyone ever want an unreliable network cabling system? No. You or someone else, if you use a third party installer, might be making many decisions regarding the components and methods used to install your LAN cable. And many of these decisions will have a long term effect on how well your network performs. 
On the other hand, if you install cable for someone else, you will want to make sure that the installation will stand the test of time. It's your reputation that's on the line, and you may be responsible for repairs should any failures occur uh, at some later time. A good philosophy is to install LAN cabling in such a manner that when network problems occur, it will never be the cabling system that is at fault. If you adhere to this guideline, you will save countless hours of tedious and expensive troubleshooting, even though wiring components are relatively simple physical devices. They have technically uh, sophisticated operating characteristics that require expensive equipment and trained technicians to troubleshoot. Performance issues are greatly compounded if you use the wiring to its maximum capability. And because many companies with LAN installations do not have access to the sophisticated wire test equipment, many LAN managers start troubleshooting a problem by looking at the servers, the routers, the hubs, and the workstations that are connected to the cabling systems. They check the configurations of network software, drivers, and the applications. They may even change uh, out hardware, including computers or printers, hub cards, or whatever seems to be related to the problem. After all that thrashing about, you, you never want the cable to be at fault. Too much e emotional and physical energy has been tied up in troubleshooting by uh, the time they get to the cable. And it better not be the cable's fault if, after they've gone through all that headache. And we always tell you guys in the first place, anyhow, always start with the physical layer. Typically, whenever something's wrong, it's going to be a physical layer issue. So to prevent all of this energy from getting expended at you, just make certain the cable system is done right Proper installation of LAN wiring has become considerably more difficult as LAN speeds push upward. You should install all your wire in accordance with the latest standards, particularly those that address cable routing. Telecommunications room locations, uh, handling of the cable itself, and the workmanship. Proper planning, components, installation practices, and workmanship will make your cable system uh, installation both reliable and maintainable. It's time to talk about structured cabling. The concept of structured cabling is basic to the philosophy of modern LAN wiring. Structured cabling is a hierarchical system of wiring structures that are designed to distribute connectivity from a central concentration point through intermediate concentration points to individual workstation locations. With the higher speeds of today's networks, it is recognized that the total length of a cable that connects from the hub to the workstation or other device has a finite maximum length. The entire networking system must therefore be broken up into chunks that allow workstation uh, or station wire to be concentrated, with each cable length short enough to support the desired data rate. Structured wiring uh, standards have been developed to help the LAN user plan a wiring system that stays within the maximum wiring distance for various LAN topologies. For example, in the case of a 100 base T, the cable must be no more than 100 meters or 328 feet, including the patch and the equipment cords. This same structure works for 10 and, gig and gigabase T as well. Now we achieve the needed wiring concentration by placing telecommunication rooms or wiring centers at appropriate locations in a building and then interconnecting those wiring closets as needed to provide the total network connectivity for the building. Typically a model of uh, a multi-story building is used to illustrate this structure concept as shown here behind me. Now on each floor of our model a telecommunications room or TR concentrates all the station uh, cables for that floor. Each workstation location has a wall or service mounted jack. The network cable is then terminated at the jack and runs directly to the wire center. Now this is called a home run. Now as there are no intermediate connections we have it goes from end from uh, telecommunications jack to the closet. There's no splices, taps, or daisy chains in between. 
Now the wire may run in a in wire trays or in conduit or may be draped over supports, which means running over a drop ceiling. This type uh, with push-up ceiling tiles is no longer permitted and it's against most code. We use something called J-hooks uh, on the uh, on the wire floor joists is above. Now at the uh, TR each station wire is then terminated uh, on an appropriate punch down termination or directly into a patch panel location. The punch downs or patch panels may be mounted to a wall or in a freestanding rack or cabinet. Uh, in the telecommunication rooms, some of the network devices, such as a hub or concentrator, uh, will be connected to each station cable and then electrically uh, uh, terminated at the terminate the cable run there. Now the hub passes the LAN signals onto other stations or wire centers for ultimate connectivity uh, within the entire network. Now the process is essentially the same for different network topologies. Although the token ring uses passive wiring concentrators called a multi-station axis access uh, unit or uh, an MSAU rather than using active hubs uh, of 10, 100 or gigabase T. Now a TR is typically concentrated to the TRs on the other floors. Now this center to center wiring is usually done with uh, from floor to floor to floor as a backbone and with land hubs on each floor. And in some cases it may be more effective to concentrate TRs on several floors into a single backbone concentrator uh, on a one of the floors. Ideally, the TR should be located directly above one another to minimize the cable runs between them. But that varies from building to building. Fiber optic cable sometimes is a good choice of wiring between the TRs that is, 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 um, as it totally eliminates grounding and bonding uh, concerns that exist with metallic cable and, and can often be run much longer distance than the copper cables. Obviously, there are differences between the wiring considerations for station wiring on a single floor and for TR to TR wiring between floors. For one thing, the fire protection requirements may be different from the vertical riser cabling used between floors. Physical uh, securing of the riser cable may also be different, as may be the need for strength. For this reason, uh, it is convenient to have terms for the two wiring paths that easily distinguish the concepts and physical characteristics of the cable. Station wire from the wire center to the, to the workstation is simply called horizontal wiring. A somewhat logical name as most of the wiring uh, horizontal across the uh, single floor of a building. Actually it is probably uh, running horizontally in the ceiling tiles, ignoring these small vertical drops down the wall to the outlet. The TR to TR cable, also called uh, backbone wiring, uh, since they form uh, uh, a unifying structure between the TRs. Now, of course, a very large floor would have more than one TR to adhere to the station uh, wire maximums, but the wire between those TRs would still be referred to as a backbone. All the details of the structured wiring concept are covered later on in the chapter. Cost factors in cabling systems. Uh, needs to be concerned and we need to talk about next. Now a variety of methods exist to implement LAN wiring schemes. Most, me most methods in common use will be described in other, in other chapters and these methods may be or, or will vary in three significant degrees, all of which have cost implications. First, some LAN topologies require that certain types of wiring connections be used. For example, the Ethernet 10 base T uh, can use category 3 twisted pair and jacks, while 100 base TX and 1000 base T require category 5 E twisted pair and jacks. And 100 base FX and 1000 base SX and LX require the proper mode fiber and connectors. Now, although your network requirements will frequently dictate which topology you must use, you may have several choices to make that will influence initial cabling cost as well as the cost of future expansion. In some cases, it would be possible to choose an older wire technology such as 10 base T on the basis of cost. However, when you consider the cost of future upgrade to 100 or gig, a CAT 5E unshielded twisted pair installation would only support 10 meg, 10 base T, but 100 meg, 100 meg uh, base and gig for the future. 
Likewise, you may want to invest in CAT6 or CAT7 wiring components to support any future upgrades. Secondly, land wiring method methods uh, vary in the extent to which they will support higher speed network data rates, including future standards that may not be fully implemented yet. For example, it is, possible, it is probably less expensive uh, to install a CAT5e cabling system that supports your current need for 10100 networking than it will be to install an advanced CAT6 or CAT7 facility. The Category 5e will support 1000 megabits or 4 pair, but that is its limit. You might never need the, the gig or 10 gig uh, capability, particularly if your facility uh, will be occupied for less than 5 years, but um, what if you had to stay longer? Should you put in CAT5e jacks and cable uh, to save money, or should you go ahead and install CAT6 or even CAT7? In, uh, in case the future uh, comes along a little, little sooner than expected, uh, you need to make that decision. Third, you may choose combinations of cable and connection hardware that differ in feature and in cost. And this factor may also influence the final installed cost of the network cabling system. Even among manufacturers that offer products certified to identical uh, performance ratings, there is a lot of price variation. You may choose a big name manufacturer whose cable and uh, connectors cost more than the little guys. Some manufacturers have products with extra features such as a modular snapping construction or fancy color inserts. Some even offer special 10 or 15 year warranties uh, if you use uh, their cable connectors and certified installers. Others offer separate wire termination and jack modules that plug together in, in many cases the extra features will cost you extra money. You'll have to judge the benefit of these extra cost features for your, for your situation. In other sections of this book, you will try, uh, we will try to point out the cost trade-offs of the devices that are described. You should be aware that any time a connector, cable, or other wiring device is referred to as easier or uh, flexible, there might be a cost implication to have that luxury. Remember that your goal is to not necessarily to specify or install the cheapest wiring solution, but to find the balance among the features, the cost and reliability that meets both your current and planned future needs. Mixing data and telephone, uh, combining conventional analog or digital telephone signals with data on different pairs of the same cable is sometimes a consideration for cost savings and efficiency. This is uh, this mixed media approach is an option that may work fine in your lower speed network environment such as the 10 base T or token ring, but it, it uh, may be fraught with problems at a higher 100 to uh, a gig LAN. At least there are lots of ifs uh, when we start doing that hybrid approach. If your telephones are analog and your LAN speed is conventional and the telephone cross connect is the, in the same TR as the LAN hubs, then you probably could use the same cable for data and phone uh, successfully. This case assumes that you're using at least CAT3 cable and minimum data grade uh, and that the cable runs are not too close to the 90 meter maximum. However, if your telephones are digital and you intend to use 100 or 1000 meg uh, LAN data or you are installing the LAN hubs in a separate TR from the telephone interconnects, then you should you run two separate cables for data and for voice, even if your voice is voice over IP. For that matter, if you know that the telephone installers are apt to be overly creative around the LAN wiring, you should run separate cables color-coded for added protection. As the table here behind me shows, some of the typical recommendations for telephone and data voice and data uh, is the phenomenon of crosstalk that occurs between pairs of the same cable. Now the higher frequency components of, of 100 gig LAN signals along with their greater attenuation per foot of cable run make them more susceptible to interference from other sources. 
Such sources clearly include digital phones and other land signals. Even magnetic fields from fluorescent lighting uh, can cause problems. At cable room distance that approach the maximum limit, these land signals are significantly more susceptible to problems from crosstalk, signal balance, interfering signals, magnetic coupling, and also noise sources. The danger of interference from telephone pairs is probably less for the analog signals of conventional telephones because they limit transmitted frequencies to 4 uh, kilohertz or less. However, both analog and digital telephones may use extra wire pairs for power. This power connection is unbalanced and may serve to increase the undesired coupling effects that um, coupling effects between pairs in the cable. Some uh, cabling designers feel that data and telephone wiring should never be mixed. There is some support for this view from these standards when interrupted when interpreted strictly. Now none of the standards provide guidelines for the application of two or more signals to the same cable, although some users simply ignore the issue. The most widely used standard, the TIA EIA 568C, simply suggests two cables to each telecommunications outlet and recommends that each be used for only one application. If you're going to provide separate cable runs for phone and data, you can easily run them to, uh, to totally separate areas of a wiring closet or even to separate wiring closets. You'll never cause a technical problem with either LAN or telephone systems by separating data and voice cables. On the other hand, you can expect the installation costs to be higher in almost all cases. A voice over IP is a relatively new method of digitizing and transporting voice signals as conventional IP packets. Voice connections to desk phones can now be made using the same data cable as the workstation computer. However, totally mixing voice and data in this manner is potentially problematic. Some voice experts recommend totally separate physical networks, including cabling uh, for voice over IP networks. If you have any doubts about the basis for this approach, consider first how often your computer network goes down, and then try to remember the last time the phones failed. Next, we want to uh, talk about uh, the three keys to successful structured LAN wiring uh, installation, and, and the, one of the three keys are proper design, quality materials, good workmanship. Now proper design involves a careful orchestration of several complex factors applied in a standard fashion to produce a successful installation plan that will meet your needs for today and for the future. These factors include the length of run, wire type, wire terminations, and the routing. Now I'm not talking about the routing of routers, I'm not the routing of how we got our cable from point A to point B. Now many of the technical details are covered uh, in other areas of, this, of our chapter and the book. Here we're going to talk about an overview of these factors and how they come into play in creating a successful land design. In creating your cable design, you'll have to make many decisions. Most of these decisions will be reduced to a few simple rules so that your overall performance requirements actually dictate the proper components to choose. In this way, you will ensure that the final wiring system design will provide the connectivity, performance, and growth that you need. This section gives a brief explanation of structured cabling concepts with a summary of some of the design considerations involved and culminates in a simple design example. Later on, we'll talk about many of the common wire types and wiring systems that are or have been used in land wiring. Now, although some of the, uh, the older cabling methods are no longer being used in new installation, it is important that they, uh, they be here for uh, completeness and for those who must add or modify the older cabling systems. For the most part, we're going to talk about unshielded twisted pair wiring when setting design factors and installation techniques. This has been the area of heated activity in the specification of wire installation and performance standards and introduction of new technologies. It is clearly where the action is. 
Fiber optic cabling is also a current technology, but its use in the workplace is limited at, a pres at present. It is more expensive to buy, more difficult and expensive to install, it requires more expensive workstation and hub interfaces, and generally exceeds the bandwidth required for the current and next generation of LAN data throughput. Fiber optic, fiber optic cabling does, however, have several unique and very beneficial characteristics that can be of great assistance in larger cabling designs. For that reason, a description of fiber optic cabling is included whenever that medium is particularly useful. Now, in order to talk about the intricacies of a subject such as structured land wiring, we need a common lexicon. Now, unfortunately, the cabling industry has developed it uh, as a combination of many technologies and many disciplines, each with its own vocabulary and terminology. Many of the twisted pair wiring technologies we use in today's land wiring were, in it, uh, were initially the domain of the telephone industry. In fact, these styles of wire, connectors, terminations, and even the color codes that we use today were developed decades before anyone considered using telephone type wire for digital networks. Many of these tele telephone terms have been made directly um, have made directly a part of land wiring vocab. Now on the other hand, all the terms that are used for land wiring signals, cables, standard, and termination equipment come from the computer networking industry. So now that we are pushing the envelope into the stratosphere of land speed performance, we are beginning to encounter even newer terms that may be unfamiliar to many of us, but would make any radio frequency or RF engineer smile. So I want to direct our attention now to twisted pair cabling, the basic wire type for most current land wiring installations. is called twisted pair. Now some refer to this wire as unshielded twisted pair or UTP to differentiate it from shielded twisted pair. Now, this type of wire is relatively inexpensive, easy to connect and provides self shielding properties to minimize harmful interference to or from the cable. Twisted pair wire was originally used by the telephone industry to enable <clears throat> the widely separated individual wires that once populated telephone poles uh, to be replaced by wire pairs in very close proximity. This twisted pairing allows more than one telephone conversation to be carried within the same cable jacket. The twisting causes the electromagnetic coupling from one wire to another to be cancelled out and eliminates the interfering crosstalk between pairs. Any significant amount of crosstalk coupling limits the length of cable that can be used. Now, while the amount of coupling is insignificant at audio or voice frequencies, it becomes much greater at the higher LAN frequencies. That is one of the reasons we did not, or we have to have a limit on the length of LAN cabling. The construction of twisted pair cable is described in more detail later on. Now, the use of twisted pair cable is a key component in LAN wiring system design. The properties of this type of cable define the maximum usable length of a workstation cable at any given LAN data rate. The characteristics of LAN cable are carefully specified in the applicable standards, particularly at the higher LAN speeds. Now, these performance characteristics are traditionally the limiting factor, and at 100 megabits per second, we were supposedly pushing the capabilities of twisted pair wire. At 155 meg, we we thought we were at the practical limit for a useful cable length to the workstation for two pair connections. But several new methods uh, use all four pair to jump all the way to a gig and are still not at the limit. And new types of cable and connectors are offering to take copper cabling to 10 gig per second. Now the Elect Electronics Industries Alliance, the EIA, and the Telecommunications Industry Association, TIA, standards Specify the maximum length from the wiring closet to the to the workstation at 100 meters, or 90 meters from the horse for horizontal cabling, or station cable to the wall jack, and 10 meters for the patch uh, cord plus the user cord. This is approximately approximately 328 feet and should be sufficient for most building installations. However, it does 
put one at the outer limit of performance where everything becomes critical from routing and handling to measurement and certification. In addition to these net network structured cabling standards allow for all types of other networks. For example, several standards for the asynchronous transmission mode ATM uh, forum specify twisted pair wiring for the medium. Now these new connectivity options range in speeds from 25 meg per second to 155 meg per second and use the TIA EIA 568C 990 meter horizontal cable link as a model. Now some high speed networking proposals use two pairs while others use four pairs. Now the higher speeds may require the use of premium category 5E cable and connecting hardware, but they still operate at conventional metallic twisted pair cable. Now clearly twisted pair wiring has a lot to offer for the future of networking. Now structured wiring based on the standards such as 568C assumes that the total wiring systems will be divided into simple wiring units. Now these wiring units can be repeated as needed combined into larger structures, and those structures interconnected to produce the overall wiring system. And although some standards exist for implementing particular LAN topologies, such as 10 base and 100 base T over a wiring system, most of the standards simply require a generic multi-purpose reusable wiring and cabling system that can be used for anything from voice to video. Now, of course, these standards are designed to allow land traffic to properly operate at specific data rates, and they specify test parameters to ensure performance. However, the standards for the cabling itself are not at all specific to any type of LAN. Now, this is an enormous advantage to you as a cable system designer, installer, or LAN manager. Now, if you install a standards-based structured wiring system, you do not need to know anything about all the exact type of LAN or you don't need to know anything at all about the exact type of LAN that will be installed in your wiring system. All you need to know is what data rate will be expected for the LAN, because this will determine the category of cable that you must be, that you must be using. The most significant standard in LAN wiring is the 568C Commercial Building Telecommunications Wiring Standard, along with related standards and bulletins. The standard defines a universal cabling system that meets a variety of needs. The TIA is really the moving force behind the standard, and although it is approved by the EIA and ANSI and coordinated with many national and international standards, by the way, one normally says letters TIA individually, okay? Although you, um, although you could certainly say as a word like TIA, is what I normally do, uh, any type of voice data or land standard or land signals can be connected to your structured cabling system. Uh, for example, whether the twisted pair wiring system that is specific uh, is specified by 568C will allow you to run a long, uh, analog or digital voice 10 base T, uh, 100 base TX, or uh, or 100 base T4 Ethernet, um, and so on, <clears throat> and going all the way up to token ring, um, copper, FIDI, uh, ATM, okay, uh, and so on, and other different rated speeds. Of course, these integrated services, uh, the ISDN, um, 568K, uh, T1s and E1s, and other telephone services will all be comp uh, compatible with our structured wiring systems using the 568C. Also, several products who distribute video over twisted pair uh, in the NTSC format will be introduced, and then it can even distribute the IBM 5250 and 3270 terminals over the same wire. Such a wide range of uses makes the term generic seem a little bit inadequate. Perhaps multi-purpose or general use would better describe our structured cabling systems. So the versatile 560JC wiring system is a powerful advantage to any organization that would use it. And so for this reason, uh, you need to be aware of, uh, or aware of the compromises that limit your wiring system's utility. Although you may have a very specific purpose in mind, uh, who can say to what use the wiring system uh, will be put over in the next 10 to 20 years. 
So the international standards also cover much of the same ground. For the most part, these standards are all coordinated. It would be tiresome indeed to constantly list all these uh, coordinated or reference standards for each uh, siting, just like I didn't go through all the different types of uh, wiring and speeds and categories that we had just a moment ago. Uh, therefore, we'll simply use the U.S. standard uh, number in most cases, a fairly complete list of U.S., Canadian, European community, and the international standards uh, were in the back of the book. Standards that are coordinated are, are, are noted. The uh, structural wiring system comprises several component structures within a building, and uh, structures are called horizontal and backbone wiring. The structured wiring component parts uh, uh, wiring system defines a series of wiring elements that are assembled and connected to form telecommunication links. Uh, the basic elements are the horizontal wiring structure, uh, the backbone wiring structure, and a series of cross-connect structures that include the main cross-connect, the intermediate cross-connect, and the horizontal cross-connect. Now these last three elements are usually contained in dedicated rooms within a building. For example, the horizontal cross connector HCC is contained in the TR and is identified as such. And the other rooms are often identified as uh, with by their structure names as well. The MC for main cross connect or intermediate cross connect for IC. Backbone cable runs between the cross connect structures while horizontal wiring runs from the TR to the individual workstations. The hierarchy is illustrated here, and the structure holds within a, um, within a single commercial building and between cable buildings and as, on a, as on a campus. Now, although the structured cabling or structured wiring concept actually comes from the telephone industry and thereby predates data uses of twisted pair cabling, its use is particularly critical to modern data networks. Structured wiring defines the precise maximum distances between um, distances types, um, distances the types of connections, the grade of cable uh, and connectors, and the installation practices that are necessary to provide reliable, flexible data and voice cabling uh, infrastructure. The embodiment of modern structured data voice wiring is the 560C standard from North America, and also the ISO. IEC uh, 11801 standard for the European community. For the most part, the balance of the countries around the world use one of these standards for their local cabling guidelines. Fortunately, these primary standards are becoming more and more coordinated through a process of international technical cooperation uh, called harmonization. Now, the next few sections describe the major wiring strategies of the horizontal and backbone cable. Horizontal wiring takes the bulk of our attention in land wiring as it uh, is the most complex structure and offers the most challenges to designer and installers alike. The horizontal wiring structure, the basic component of the structured wiring system, is the horizontal wiring or cabling structure. The horizontal cabling consists of uh, the cable and the connections from the wall or other jack at the wire termination in TR. Now as shown in the figure behind me, the horizontal wire may include a punch down block, cross connect wire, and a patch panel. However, it does not include hubs, routers, and the network adapters. The horizontal cable is defined in the 568 commercial building telecommunications wiring standard is and is the permanent uh, link minus the cross connect and test cables. Originally defined in the TSB 627 or Trained Commission Performance Specifications for the field testing of unshielded twisted pair cabling systems. In practice, uh, horizontal wire is routed directly from the TR to the workstation without the intermediate splice joints. Cable junctures or taps, um, as might become practice in traditional telephone wiring. This direct wiring technique is referred to as, we said earlier, a home run and various wiring standards put uh, special qualifications on horizontal wiring. Some of these may limit types of components such as cross connects and may be part of the horizontal wiring. More specifically, you should make sure that you use the cable and components that are rated for the data rates you intend to use. If you're installing Cat5e, uh, 
a Cat 5e facility, you must use Cat 5e graded jacks, uh, cable, patches, and use a cord. And if you use a cross connect um, field to connect between the station cables and a patch panel, the cross connect wire must also be Cat 5e. Same will be true for Cat 6. All components, including cables, connectors, and cords, must be Cat 6 rated to achieve Cat 6 performance. Cat 7 is the first standard that allows deviation from the ubiquitous 8 position modular connector, which is the RJ45. The connectors and the cables are quite different in appearance from the lower rated categories. Uh, so a Cat 7 installation is a little easier to spot, but to the uh, casual eye and perhaps the trained one. Cat 5E and 6 cable and components look identical, but vary widely in their performance. In the horizontal wiring structure as shown here behind me, the station cable is terminated in the area of each user workstation with the appropriate jack. The jack is, jack is typically an 8-pin modular female connector in a flush mount wall plate. Now that mounts in a single gang utility outlet box or metal attachment ring secured in a hollow sheetrock drywall. The 8-pin modular jack is sometimes referred to as an RJ45 because the connector jack components are the same. However, RJ45 actually applies to the special purpose jack configuration that is not used in LAN or standard telephone wiring. Several types of 8-pin jacks are available and may be a single simplex jack, dupe dual or duplex, or modular snapping jacks of up to six jacks per plate. Solid walls, plaster walls, or hard to reach locations may use a service mounted uh, jack enclosure such as a biscuit block or a flush mount jack in a service mount box. An appropriate surface raceway to reach the user uh, outlet location. Modular furniture requires uh, special consideration because the workstation cable may need to be dropped from the ceiling uh, or a run from an adjacent wall into wired channels within the modular furniture units. Uh, some furniture provides special channels for telephone and computer wiring that is separated from the AC power wiring uh, channels. Caution should be used when sharing the power wiring channel with the data cabling. Not only is there a potential safety concern from having the land wire so close to power wire voltages, but there may be performance problems particularly for CAT 5e performance. Some guidelines specify a two-in-one or more uh, separation from uh, power wires, while others specify a greater distance. In addition, local and national installation codes generally prohibit low-voltage wiring from being installed in the same conduit as power wires. Some local authorities may consider the open wiring channels of modular furniture to be in fact a conduit and therefore subject to this rule. Modular channels with a divider uh, avoid this problem. Horizontal wiring is specified according to the performance categories defined in the 5C both cable and connecting hardware. Uh, both cable and connecting hardware must meet performance guidelines appropriate for their use. Not all cable or components meet the minimum standards required for LAN use. One of these factors affecting performance in outlet jacks is the method of wire termination. The station cable connects to the jack by means of either screw terminals or some sort of insulation uh, displacement um, termination. Screw terminations were acceptable in Category 3 installations but are prohibited in Cat 5B or 6 installations because of the performance constraints. Cat 3 is adequate for 10 or 16 MHz bandwidth networks. Cat 4, 20 MHz and Cat 5E, 100 MHz. Now, for the most part, no networks require CAT4 specifications, although it was used uh, if you desire a high-grade CAT3 installation. Some references suggest CAT4 or token ring networks for token ring networks, but the legacy standards required only CAT3. CAT5E is now the minimum specification. In installation, displacement, uh, displacement terminations use a split metal contact uh, upon which the insulated wire is forced, thereby cutting through the insulation into making metal uh, to metal contact with the copper wire. Several types of insulation displacement connectors uh, exist between modular snap together IDC jacks. 
modular 110 type IDC jacks and the older 66 type IDC jack plates, uh, except for the 66 type jacks that are commonly available in models that are certified to uh, CAT 5E performance standards. CAT 5E 66 blocks do exist, but the installer may have difficulty in maintaining the required twist uh, uh, all the way to the termination point. Now for the workstation outlet jack, the horizontal station cable is run to the designed wiring closets. Now this cable is designed to be with, within, possibly, possibly well within the 90 meter maximum speci uh, specified by the standard. It may be routed with other individual station cables and wiring trays um, through support rings over, a, over small bit support beams or frames through firewalls or even in conduit. If you have special performance criteria such as CAT 5E or, or 6, you should take precautions to avoid fluorescent um, uh, lights. Uh, electrical wiring, uh, heavy equipment such as an elevator or other large motors, and metal beams or metal walls. In general, the electrical wiring and metal frames may be crossed, uh, preferably at, at right angles, but not run alongside them. Other authorities suggest that a two-foot separation be maintained from these sources. The EIA TIA 569 uh, provided specific guidelines, but these were dropped um, in 569-A. Now, station wire must be a, of, of a category that conforms to applicable performance standards. Obviously, a CAT 5E installation requires CAT 5E certified cable. However, a Category 3 installation could actually use CAT 5E or 6 certified cable, since either would be that would exceed the requirement. And in some cases, existing telephone station wire may be able to perform at the lower data rates of CAT 3, which can then be verified through testing. Now, if the wire was installed after about 1984, it probably has enough twist per foot to approximate uh, current Category 3 standards. Now, prior to that time, telephone twist repair cable was sometimes manufactured with less than two twists per foot. This was made to meet the more stringent AT&T premises distribution standards. A cable scanner that measures impedance and near-end crosstalk should give you an indication whether uh, such cable will work adequately. You should be aware that None of the current uh, TIA EIA standards encourage you to steal pairs from the existing telephone station cable, but you may be able to retrofit an existing installation if absolutely necessary. Station wire must also have an installation type that meets safety and fire protection standards. The fire protection and safety standards are specified by the UL or Underwriters Laboratories and the National Fire Protection Association, also the National Electrical Code, and then the Canadian Standards Association, the ISO, the European Standards, and individual country standards in other parts of the world. Now these standards are meant uh, to exclude flammable cables or one that uh, exhausts uh, toxic gases when placed in a flame. So for any, for any uh, plenum spaces. Now plenum is that air duct or return air duct that is used for forced air circulation, such as a heating or air conditioning system. Any airspace uh, used uh, for forced air circulation, other than an actual room in technical work areas, is what we call a plenum, which means that area above the drop ceiling. And uh, we cannot use non plenum rated cabling up there. A common arrangement is to use a plastic uh, return air grid in place of ceiling top or to use a fluorescent lighting fixtures with a row of uh, vent openings uh, along the edges to provide air return into an above ceiling area and eventually back to the HVAC handler. Now all this space is air plenum, requires special plenum rated cabling and we will, uh, we will cover that at, at another time. Now um, the tele telecommunications room components uh, cables and cable ratings are, are going to be covered uh, in a later chapter, in chapter 5. Wire and cable technology for LANs uh, are all in the, the appendix. Uh, the TR, the wiring closet, is the gathering point for all of the home run cables that serve workstations of a particular floor or area in your building. The size and the location. 
of the Iwana class are actually specified in standards 569A. The standard then refers to several types of wiring closets, such as the TR and IC and MC. Such a variety of wiring closets is appropriate for telephone wiring, uh, since it is much more uh, extensible than LAN cabling. However, since the topic of this book is restricted to LAN wiring, we are going to uh, simply um, uh, discuss this just, but we're just going to call it the telecommunications room. Now, for our purposes, all wiring outward from the patch or other station wire termination point to the workstation outlet jack will be considered simply horizontal cabling and will conform to those standard practices that are appropriate for LAN wiring. Now, as we talked about earlier, horizontal cabling includes the, um, the wire terminations in the telecommunications closet or termination room. You will typically bring all the individual station cables into the wiring closet at the same entry point down the wall onto the wiring board, okay? Now wiring boards are often uh, large, four foot by eight foot sheets of three quarter inch plywood mounted securely onto a wall of the TR and then painted for appropriate, uh, an appropriate color. The 569A has a color code for every type of cross neck, but you can probably use a neutral color of your choice for the wiring board. Uh, an alternative TR arrangement uses freestanding equipment racks or rails. Cables are routed in cable trays or in bundles across the tops of the racks down the track to the point of cable termina termination. This is useful for very large installations where much equipment and many station terminations would exist. Care should be taken in securing the cables and cable bundles to ceilings, uh, the walls, racks, and wire termination devices. In Cat 5B and 6 installations, tightly binding cables with, uh, uh, with uh, tire apps should be avoided because it may deform the cable enough to distort electrical characteristics. Likewise, you should maintain minimum bend radius and avoid cables um, or with cable bundles. Uh, avoid sharp corners and other abrasive uh, edges. S uh, station wires may be terminated in the TR on a punch down block such as a 66M or 110 type, or it may be terminated directly into a patch panel. Uh, if a punch down block is used, cross connect wire must be run between the station wire termination and any other connection device such as a patch, uh, patch panel. One alternative is to use a punch down block with a built in connector, typically uh, a so called 50 pin telco connector. Now, a fan out adapter cable, often called a hydro or octopus cable, connects uh, from the, uh, the connectorized punch down block and then splits to six. Um, or eight or even uh, 12 8 pin modular uh, connectorized cables that can individually plug into a hub uh, to get uh, from punch down to a patch panel. Now, a 50 pin jumper cable could be used instead of an octopus cable. Some manufacturers also offer punch down blocks with built in 8 pin modular jack connections. Now, although some of these devices may be certified to CAT 4 or 5, they are much more appropriate for CAT 3 installations. Direct patch panel termination is often used uh, for CAT 5 e and 6 installation. These, this method provides an advantage of simple one uh, location termination. There are no cross connects, punch down blocks, or jumper cables, or fan on adapters, or telco connectors. All of these are potential trouble spots for CAT 5 e and CAT 6 since each wire termination includes untwist, introduces the untwist of all components, and they all have to be certified. Now, the installation testing is also simplified with patch panel termination because all station cables compose a permanent link to and can be easily scanned to a certification standard. These, uh, the only possible disadvantage to patch panel termination is that multiple use applications of the station cables are difficult because each cable terminates into one patch panel location. Some suppliers offer plug-in adapters with dual cable terminations, but this still limits the station cable to uh, two four-wire jack terminations. This disadvantage is probably not too serious because it allows one to totally comply with wiring standards and special applications can always be handled as an exception with an adapter cable. Backbone wiring structure. Backbone wiring uh, may be uh, within one building or between 
buildings on a campus, and all wire between telecommunication rooms, TMCs, ICs, and TRs, is referred to as backbone wiring. And in many cases, this backbone wiring will be between wiring closets on the same floor of a building, but the classic case is the multi-floor model, as we see here behind me. Now, some standards refer to this as vertical wiring. And in contrast to horizontal uh, wiring, and because of the confusion with logical land backbone segments, which may or may not run on backbone wiring, we will simply call it backbone wiring and point out those few instances uh, when we are referring specifically to a LAN standard specifications. Backbone wiring is usually simpler than horizontal cabling. It is customary to place LAN hubs or concentrators in each TR to connect all the workstation wires served by that TR. Backbone wiring then connects the hubs uh, one to another. Backbone wiring may be implemented in a daisy chain, hub to hub fashion, or in a star fashion. Now, in a network topology that must guard against too many repeater jumps, such as Ethernet, the star connection for backbone wiring provides advantages. Since TRs in large buildings are frequently in, uh, in a services shaft, one above the other, distances between TRs are typically minimal. Thus, the backbone wiring from each, uh, from each floor may be concentrated in a single master TR and the number of repeater jumps minimized. For, the, uh, for other topologies, such as token ring. It might be more convenient to daisy chain the ring in, ring out from floor to floor. In any event, the maximum cabling distances must still be observed. Backbone cabling must be terminated in the same manner as horizontal cabling. The backbone cable should be of category and meet the, uh, uh, the performance requirements and the safety and fire protection requirements for your installation. If your installation requires CAT5V horizontal cable, for example, you should use the CAT5V cable for your backbone wiring. It does not hurt to use a higher category of cable than needed. You might use CAT6 anyway. If you anticipate using your uh, wiring system for multiple applications, double or triple each backbone wiring run. This will give you an ample room for growth and the ability to rapidly respond to new requirements. These standards require that all riser cable um, cable that goes vertically between floors um, be riser rated. While some local authorities may require the, the tougher fire uh, specifications of plenum, in any event, any openings you make between um, in any, any openings you make between the floors, whether in cable ports or direct openings, should have a fire shop material uh, properly installed. Uh, this is particularly important in taller buildings and you would need to consult the NEC UL standards and local standards for uh, more guidance. When wiring between the far-flung TRs or between floors, electrical grounding and bonding requirements should also be observed. The EIA TIA 607 des describes the proper practice in detail. Now, as fewer cables are used for backbone wiring, you may be tempted to terminate the, the cables directly into an 8-pin modular male connector plug. Backbone cabling uses solid copper wire, and since most 8-pin modular plugs are designed for stranded wire, uh, you could easily create a future problem. Now, just imagine an intermittent network failure that cures itself when you touch the backbone cable plug. Solid wire, 8-pin uh, modular connectors are certainly available, but they are impossible to distinguish without close examination, and most installers recommend against their use. A better approach is to simply use the same patch panel or punch down that terminates the station cables to terminate the backbone cables. Mark the backbone cable patch position clearly to differentiate it. You may wish to uh, more clearly identify backbone wiring by using cable colors, cross connect, patch panel colors, and special markings. These colors and markings identified in the 569A are covered in later chapters. If your backbone wiring actually involves floor-to-floor -floor cabling in vertical shafts or cable ports, you may need to use special riser cable that has a fire retardant sheath uh, certified to meet the NEC low flame requirements. The NEC requires that riser cable meet UL flammability tests to be used in high-rise buildings. Local regulations may supplement or amend these requirements.
local building inspector should be able to advise you about the requirements in your area. As a last word on backbone cabling, the fiber optic uh, cable may provide some significant advantages over copper. Fiber optic cable is not subject to electrical or magnetic interference and thus may be run in locations such as an elevator shaft alongside power lines that would cause problems for metallic cable. In addition, a cable system may be electrically isolated uh, between buildings or between floors of the same building by using fiber optic cable. Metallic cable, on the other hand, uh, must be carefully installed with adequate consideration of grounding and bonding. Fiber optic cable may also be used for multiple applications with the use of uh, fiber optic multiplexers. Uh, the WDM, Wave Division Multiplexing, uh, we talked about in your CNT120 class. Thus, it will be possible for one fiber optic connection to carry Ethernet, token ring, T1, ATM, FIDI all at the same time. Fiber optic cabling must meet the same plenum and rod specifications as metallic cable. Um, now, we need to discuss location and routing. Now, the importance of location and routing of your cabling system components demand, uh, depends upon the level of cable facility that you intend to install. CAT3 installations have much more flexibility in routing uh, than Category 5B and 6. For networks that must provide 100 to, uh, to gigaspeed speeds uh, and have horizontal runs that approach the 90 meter limit, you must be very attentive to installation details. Location and routing of the station cables are critical to high performance considerations. TRs should be located so that they are within 90 meters as the of the cable runs from the proposed workstation outlets that are to be served. In some cases, the number of TRs uh, may have to be increased or relocated to stay below this distance. A scale plan drawing uh, to illustrate a basic data-only wiring system design, we're going to show you a cabling plan for a simple two-story building uh, used, using the concepts that we've, we've covered in this chapter. Our example will have 24 workstations per floor. We'll use CAT 5E specifications direct patch panel termination, and we'll have one TR per floor. We will specify the components installation and testing and we'll develop a, 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 a sample bill of materials. Now as the figure shows the layout of each floor, we will specify flush mounted jacks for the user outlets. Each user will have a 3 uh, meter category 5E cable with the wall outlet and the workstation. We will use category 5E plenum cabling with four 24 gauge twisted pairs for the station cable that runs from each user outlet to the wiring closet. And at the wiring closet we will use a wall mounted 24 position patch panel that will directly terminate each station. A 1 meter uh, CAT 5E patch cord will be provided to connect each patch position to the network hub or mount. And in some situations longer patch cords should be specified. Place the placement of your hubs uh, before uh, plan the placement of your house before ordering patch cords. Between the two floors, we will run one monitor cable of the same type as the station cables, if local codes permit. Of course, the LAN network will also need appropriate LAN switches, hubs, or uh, multi-station access units, network adapters, servers, routers, and software. But our concern here is simply the wiring system that connects all these devices. The bill of materials shown here in the table. Now, if you have to obtain the materials, you will also have some brand name decisions to make. Some brands have special features. They offer long warranties or are easier to install. An experienced installer will have preferences that can guide your choices. There will also be some differences in quality and pricing. And all the items should be certified by the manufacturer to meet the CAT 5E performance criteria that you have set. To implement the two cables uh, per workstation suggestion on 568B, you need to double many of the quantities. The wall plates, user and patch cords, and cable are generally available in a variety of different colors. The wall plates and user cords are uh, usually color coded, coordinated, coordinated to the office. The color choices are somewhat limited, so you may have to go with a neutral color such as gray or ivory. 
Service Raceway is also available in color choices. Patch course technically fall under the miscellaneous uh, category under Patch 9A and, I, and are ideally yellow in color. However, if your wiring closet is actually a vacant wall in a common area and a sea of yellow wire would distract from the decor, you may wish to specify a more neutral color. Uh, a typical floor layout showing the telecommunication dialects and direct cable runs to the TR. You should allow 25 to 50% more cable for cable trays and obstacle avoidance. 